Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, as always, that you've given me the opportunity to come and to share uh, from your word. It's, uh, it's a blessing to me for what I learn, and I just hope, Lord, that um, it will be a blessing to those that are here, Lord. I just pray that your spirit um, would minister to your children uh, from your word, and that I might just be uh, your servant in this. Uh, I pray that you would uh, be here in power and in grace, and that uh, this time would be a blessing to all, uh, and for your glory, in Jesus' name, amen. Um, so I'm going to start um, just by reading from John um, chapter 19, um, but I'm going to read from the message version, so it's going to sound a little bit different than what you have, so if you want to follow along, it's John chapter 19. So Pilate took Jesus and had him whipped. The soldiers, having braided a crown from thorns, set it on his head, threw a purple robe over him, and approached him with, Hail, King of the Jews! Then they greeted him with slaps in the face. Pilate went back out again and said to them, I present to you, but I want you to know that I do not find him guilty of any crime. Just then Jesus came out wearing the thorn crown and purple robe. Pilate announced, Here he is, the man. When the high priests and police saw him, they shouted in a frenzy, Crucify! Crucify! Pilate told them, You take him. You crucify him. I find nothing wrong with him. The Jews answered, We have a law, and by that law he must die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he became even more scared. He went back into the palace and said to Jesus, Where did you come from? Jesus gave no answer. Pilate said, You won't talk? Don't you know that I have the authority to pardon you? and the authority to crucify you? Jesus said, You haven't a shred of authority over me except what has been given you from heaven. That's why the one who betrayed me to you has committed a far greater fault. At this, Pilate tried his best to pardon him, but the Jews shouted him down, If you pardon this man, you're no friend of Caesar's. Anyone setting himself up, against, up, anyone setting himself up as king defies Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he led Jesus outside. He sat down at the judgment seat in the area designated Stone Court, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was the preparation day for Passover. The hour was noon. Pilate said to the Jews, Here is your king. They shouted back, Kill him! Kill him! Crucify him! Pilate said, I am to crucify your king? The high priest answered, We have no king except Caesar. Pilate caved in to their demand. He turned him over to be crucified. They took Jesus away, carrying his cross. Jesus went out to the place called Skull Hill. The name in Hebrew is Golgotha. Where they crucified him and with, and with him two others. One on each side, Jesus in the middle. Pilate wrote a sign and had it placed on the cross. It read, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read the sign because the place where Jesus was crucified was right next to the city. It was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. The Jewish high priests objected. Don't write, they said to Pilate, the king of the Jews. Make it, this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate said, I, what I have written, I have written. When they crucified him, the Roman soldiers took his clothes and divided them up four ways, to each soldier a fourth. When his robe, but his robe was seamless, a single piece of weaving. So they said to each other, let's not tear it up. Let's throw dice to see who gets it. This confirmed the scriptures that said, They divided up my clothes among them and threw dice for my coat. The soldiers validated the scriptures. While the soldiers were looking after themselves, Jesus' mother, his aunt, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene stood at the foot of the cross. Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing near her. He said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then to the disciple, Here is your mother. From that moment the disciple accepted her as his own mother. Jesus, seeing that everything had been completed so that the scripture record might, be, might also be complete, then said, I'm thirsty. The jug of sour wine was standing by. Someone had a sponge soaked with wine on a javelin and lifted it to his mouth. After he took the wine, Jesus said, it's done, complete. Bowing his head, he offered up his spirit. Then the Jews, since it was the day of the Sabbath preparation, and so the bodies wouldn't stay on the crosses over the Sabbath, it was a high holy day that year, petitioned Pilate that their legs be broken to speed death, and the bodies taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man crucified with Jesus, and then the other. When they got to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead, so they didn't break his legs. 
One of the soldiers stabbed him in the side with his spear. Blood and water gushed out. The eyewitness to these things has presented an accurate report. He saw it himself and is telling the truth, so that you also will believe. These things that happened confirm the scripture. Not a bone in his body was broken. And the other scripture that reads, they will stare at the one they pierced. After all this, Joseph of Arimathea, he was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he was intimidated by the Jews, petitioned Pilate to take the body of Jesus. Pilate gave permission, so Joseph came and took the body. Nicodemus, who had first come to Jesus at night, came now in broad daylight, carrying a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about seventy-five pounds. They took Jesus' body, and following the Jewish burial custom, wrapped, him, wrapped it in linen with the spices. And there was a garden near the place where he was crucified, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been placed. So because it was the Sabbath preparation for the Jews, and the tomb was convenient, they placed Jesus in it. Easter is a time when it's both happy and sad. It's a time of remembrance and celebration. A time when we remember Jesus upon the cross, and a time when we celebrate his resurrection. But in addition, the separation between our emotions over Easter, um, there's also, it serves as a dividing point. Um, a dividing point between who we are and who we have become. A dividing point between what we deserved and what we received. And we know that who we were is tied to what we deserved and what we received is tied into who we have become. And it's an understanding who we were that shows us what we deserved. Knowing what we deserve demonstrates then the greatness of what we received and the glory of who we become. So today I want to start by looking at who we were before the cross. The authors of the New Testament don't pull any punches when it comes to reminding us of who we were before we came to the cross. In Romans chapter 3 we read, There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. After all turned away, they have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves, their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways, and the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. In Romans chapter 1 we read, They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. In 1 Peter we read, For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. This is who we were. I was thinking that while we were singing the hymns that we were called a worm and we were called vile. But that is true. That's who we were prior to coming to Jesus. We were the darkness that did not receive the light of Jesus. We were the friends of this world, and as such, we were enemies of God. We were slaves to sin, and in our sins, we were dead. Because of who we were, living lives of opposition to God and his righteousness, we deserve not love and mercy, but rather judgment and wrath. For indeed, we read that we were objects of God's wrath, destined for judgment and destruction. This is what awaited us. In Romans 1 we read, Although they know God's righteous decrees, that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do, these, to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. In Hebrews it says, For we know whom said, For we know him who said, It is mine to avenge, I will repay. And again the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell. So this was us. 
This is who we were. This is what we deserved. We were enemies of God. We did everything that we could to be apart from him. We were little better than animated corpses shuffling through life with only one thing driving us, how to best fulfill the evil desires of our flesh. We live lives filled with misery, anguish, and hate with only God's righteous judgment and his holy wrath to look forward to. We were the enemies of God, and we deserve death. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 7, But there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? I bring up this point, and I'm focusing, I guess I'm perhaps belaboring a bit, not to make people feel bad, but... Rather, it's because it's important that we don't forget what we were and from what we were saved. To know who we were and what we deserved is what makes it possible for us to truly comprehend what Christ did for us on the cross. For into the darkness of our former lives a light shone forth. It burnt away the darkness. It put an end to the future filled with the weeping and gnashing of teeth. It enveloped us in warmth and love. It healed us. It made us whole. It brought us from death to life. It is the cross that stands as the dividing line between who we were and who we have now become. It is the cross that stands as a dividing line between what we deserved and what we've received. Because it was on the cross that Jesus triumphed over sin. Colossians chapter 2 says, When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. It was on the cross that Jesus set us free, It was on the cross where Jesus reconciled us to God, making us holy in God's sight. It was on the cross that Jesus brought us from death to life. It was on the cross that Jesus made it possible for us to be the children of God. It was on the cross that Jesus granted us access to the Father. It was on the cross that Jesus gave us access to the Holy Spirit, through whom God has poured out his love towards us. It was on the cross that Jesus accomplished the eternal purpose of God, to make us a new creation, holy and righteous in the eyes of God. It was on the cross that Jesus rescued us from the dominions of darkness and brought us into his internal kingdom. It was on the cross that Jesus made possible for the forgiveness of sins. It was on the cross that Jesus granted us eternal life. It was on the cross that Jesus saved us from the wrath of God, taking it upon himself. The Apostle Paul asked the question, who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? And he also provided the answer, thank God, the answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Today is Good Friday, and because of the cross of Christ, it can truly be called good, for it marks the end of sin's reign of terror and death, for salvation has come to those who believe, through faith in the Son of God, who shed his blood and died for us upon a wooden cross. So we can truly call today good. For it was on the cross that salvation came to any who would call on Jesus' name. Now, we are all here believers. We all claim allegiance to Christ. We all claim to be his children. And so I bring up what we have been saved from as a means of encouraging us. I bring up what we have received in Christ to encourage us to then go forth and to live the lives that we've been called to live. A life marked by complete and utter love for God. And then sacrificial love for our neighbors. For this is only right. In 1 John 4, 19, we read, we, loved, we love because he first loved us. We have been loved and forgiven much, so let us love much in return. For it is only through Christ, his sacrifice upon the cross, that we can even know what love is. It is only through the cross that we were even capable of loving.
going to end in prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise your glorious name. We thank you for your saving grace extended to us, who are so unworthy of your love. Yet we were still sinners, living as your enemies. You sent your Son to die on a cross so that we could be saved, that we could be set free from the bondage and the pain of sin and become your children, made alive in Christ. I thank you, Lord, for the cross, a symbol of your love and mercy and a reminder to us of how once we were dead and how we owe you more than we can possibly give. May we be humbled by your mercy and may it spur us on to ever richer life of love and service for your kingdom and for your glory. I ask you this in the name of Jesus, through whom this prayer is possible. Amen.